pitiful goblins. My name is Gary the All-Powerful, and I am your god figure. Now bow down and grovel before me in awe. What, what, wow, Gar Gary got a promotion. Yeah, it's, it's actually like a second promotion because he was just an FTE the last time we had him in a video. Wait, 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 what, what does FTE stand for again? It stands for full-time employee. You moron. But but wait, I I thought we were called associates at this company. No, no, that would be stupid. Lawyers can become associates. We're just employees. Yep, yep, that's right. Associates is a misnomer. Indeed. Some companies call their employees associates to make them feel better about having to work for the man. Ooh, maybe, maybe someday I can be the man. No, no, you will never be the man. Yeah, if this idiot ever becomes the man, I'm gonna go all stabby stabby on myself. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. That would suck. You, you, you guys are jerks. Hey, so what's the deal? Are these goblins groveling and worshiping me or what? Yes, Gary, they certainly are. Welcome to the DM Layer. I'm Luke Hart and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school. On this channel, I give practical Dungeon Master advice that you can implement at your game table. Today, I'll be telling you the story about the time I played Gary the Intern in my first Adventures League game, all of the trouble that Gary caused, and how I'm amazed they invited me back for a second game. And real quick before we jump in, I just want to let you know that I'm also on both Twitter and Instagram if either of those apps are your jam. Over on Instagram, I post D&D miniature photos taken at my game sessions with many of them being minis that I've personally painted. And on Twitter, I talk about random crap because, well, that's pretty much what people on Twitter talk about. Links to both of them down below. Oh, and if you haven't joined my Discord yet, there's a hot, juicy link to that down there too. Over there, we're building a community of dungeon masters who help each other out with our games. Now that the shameless plugs are over with, let's talk about Gary the Intern and his first time in Adventures League game. Now, I got involved in Adventures League because my man Carlos from the local Adventures League chapter called Quests Are Us approached me at a convention and was like, dude, you need to come play D&D with us. So I rolled up a cobalt rogue and showed up for my first game session. So the adventure kicks off and we run into a caravan of villagers fleeing from a town that was attacked by goblins. It was your typical story sort of NPC quest giver scenario where we were learning about what had happened and what we could do to help. However, Gary saw that they had children with them and began to imply that he might want to snack on some of them. So as the caravan was leaving, Gary sneaked through the grass trying to pinpoint where the children were, though ultimately he was forced to turn away with an empty stomach. Don't ask me why this thought occurred to me. I know it's weird and certainly not the sort of thing I would make light of in real life, but it was a D&D game and it was kind of funny. And I fully realize that there are probably some of you out there right now that think this was incredibly inappropriate and that I'm a horrible, horrible man. And you're probably right. All I can say in my defense is that I was role-playing a crazy kobold. Now, I'm pretty sure the dungeon master was kind of taken aback by this and didn't really know what to do with me but I was having fun with it and I could see that the other players seemed to be too. Though I'm pretty sure they thought that Gary was an insane maniac and they'd be right about that. And check this out. When we do arrive to the town that had been attacked by goblins, the NPC quest giver there tells us that somehow, against all odds, there are no children in town anymore. Naturally, Gary was quite upset by this, but the quick-thinking dungeon master had in one fell swoop saved himself from having to deal with Gary's child-eating antics for the rest of the game session. So I don't really blame him. And with no children left in the town for Gary to snack on, he was forced to help increase the town's defenses and prepare it for further attacks by goblins. Gary gave a rousing speech to the farmers that increased their morale and aided them in a future goblin attack. He also may have said some things that were just a little bit sexist and got a whole bunch of villagers mad at him. Let's just say that the lack of children in the town did not prevent Gary from causing more trouble. So then all of the characters positioned themselves about the town as the goblins come in to attack. Gary was in the top of a building trying unsuccessfully to shoot goblins with arrows. 
So he sneaks down to ground level, circles around behind a group of goblins, and jumps out to sneak attack them. However, through a series of really bad rolls, he is completely unable to harm them at all. A child-eating, sexist kobold who is also horrible at combat that is no way to make a first impression. Fortunately, the bard casts Shatter from far away, blasting through the goblins near Gary, and thus saving him from a quick death. So then Gary moves on from this humiliating experience to another group of goblins and giant wasps. He jumps onto the back of a giant wasp whose goblin rider had been killed, and then commands the other goblins to surrender and lay down their arms. Gary claims to be their leader in disguise and commands them to obey him. At this point, I was clearly stretching. In my opinion, there is no way this should have worked. By all rights, the goblins should have turned on me, laughed, and attacked. However, to the dungeon master's credit, he decided to have the goblins go along with this. So these two goblins lay down their arms and started obeying Gary as though he were their leader. At this point, the group begins interrogating the goblins and Gary instructs them to divulge all of the information that they have about the goblin home base. Following their great leader's orders, the goblins tell us everything. So we head off to the goblins home base with the intention of stopping them from future attacks against the village. The party encounters a pair of goblins near a bridge on guard duty. Now, it had come out earlier in a conversation with the first two goblins that the goblin community worships Demogorgon. So, Gary confidently strides forward, claiming that Demogorgon is a false deity and that Gary has come to rescue them from his bondage. Gary claims that it is in fact he that is their true deity, and he has come to set his people free. And thus, it was that Gary's goblin entourage increased to four. And again, our dungeon master proved that he is much more benevolent and generous than I would have been. I say this to his credit because an amazing story was coming as a result of his saying yes to Gary's incredibly ridiculous antics. Now, I can't help but feel to some extent that he was just going along with these ideas because I was like a special guest or something. However, I think that's okay. Being YouTube famous should have some perks, right? So we continue onward, and as we arrive to the village, Gary instructs his four goblin worshippers to begin going through the goblin community and spreading the word that their true deity, Gary the All-Powerful, has arrived. This somehow, against all odds, works, and Gary finds he now has an entire goblin community following him and obeying his every command. Now, Gary could have, within all rights, had dozens of goblin warriors accompany the group to fight against these giant wasps that were causing problems. However, Gary humbly requests that only seven of the goblins' best warriors continue onward with the group. The party arrives at this giant wasp hive in the mountains, and of course the only thing to do is set it on fire. Upon setting the hive on fire, giant wasps naturally begin to swarm out of it, and upon the back of one of the wasps rides the rightful goblin leader, who is none too pleased with Gary. A battle ensues, and with the help of the seven best goblin warriors, we vanquish the foul creatures. Actually, those goblin warriors turned out to be pretty crappy and didn't do a whole lot to help us. Mind you, this is not a complaint. I'm pretty sure that they were just rolling pretty badly, and even if the dungeon master had been suppressing their usefulness, that wouldn't have really bothered me that much. I was just happy to have seven goblin warriors that went along with me. Shoot, I was also quite happy to have an entire goblin tribe that now worshipped me as their deity. That the goblins might help us in battle was just frosting on the cake. With the giant wasps defeated, we then had to go rescue some NPC who was in danger. You know what I'm talking about, the sort of NPC whose name you can't remember because it really doesn't matter. So Gary and his party of faithful adventurers and loyal goblin warriors set forth. So we arrive to this building where this nameless NPC is supposed to dwell, and the building is completely overgrown with vines and vegetation that climb up its walls and over its roof. 
Windows are busted out with thick roots growing through them. Of course, as an experienced dungeon master, I know that this is not a good sign. But Gary, extremely confident, what with his host of goblin warriors and faithful adventurers that attend to his every desire, commands his party forward. And predictably, plant-like creatures rise up to thwart us. There are several smaller ones that quickly move to encircle us, and then so do the much larger ones. Now, this was an adventure designed for levels one through five. So as an experienced dungeon master who knows a little something about challenge ratings, I'm thinking there is no way these are shambling mounds. If, if they're shambling mounds, then we're all screwed. As it turns out, only the two larger ones are shambling mounds. The rest of them are just, just, just twig blights. Even so, this is very dire news for all of us. Needless to say, this battle begins to go south very, very fast. Gary does his best to keep his crew together and to keep their morale from breaking. He orders his soldiers to hold their ground and commands the goblins to shoot the creatures down with their bows. Naturally, these plant-like creatures hone in on Gary because they realize that Gary the All-Powerful is the real threat on the battlefield. One of the shambling mounds chases Gary down and corners him on the other side of the river. Gary puts up an amazing fight. There is slashing hacking and snarling and cries of pain and suffering. However, what with Gary being level one and all, he is felled with one single blow and then killed with the second blow from the shambling mound. And alas, Gary was no more. Now I could actually see that after the first blow that took Gary down, the dungeon master was probably not going to have the shambling mound attack me a second time and kill me. So I actually had to convince the dungeon master to kill me because let's be honest, I deserved to die. However, here's the kicker. Ordinarily, I would have had to go into treasure debt to be able to raise Gary from the dead. However, because season eight in Adventurers League was ending and season nine was beginning, there was a technicality in the rules that would allow me to raise Gary from the dead for free. But not only that, because of a second technicality due to the season change, I'd also be able to take level three instead of just level two. Not bad for my first Adventures League game, huh? Let me know what you would have done with Gary if you had been the Dungeon Master. And next week, we'll be talking about the best D&D gifts for this holiday season. But until then, click right here to watch a video about the time my wizard's player, my player's wizard, soloed an entire dungeon through deception checks. And until next time, let's play D&D. &D.